Welcome to another episode of King's World. Okay, before we get started today, I want to send a big shout out to all those people who are sending me messages through Instagram, Facebook, email, even my boys with the text messages. Everyone's loving King's World, and so is Generation Iron. They're loving it too, as you can tell with all the advertisements and all that stuff that's going on right now. But Hey, man, this is what we wanted. We're growing. And a special, special thank you to all those people who came up to me at the Team Universe this past weekend and gave me love and said how much they love the realness, the reality, the smacking the d***s around. They love it. And, um, you know, I'm, I love you guys, too. And uh, especially that kid that came up. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. A Brazilian kid. He was, he was like, flipping out when he saw me. And these twin Brazilian sisters came and they take pictures with me. Man, it's just seeing people like that and the reactions that they're giving me makes all this shit worthwhile. Okay, so what are we going to talk about this week? You know what? I'm going to pull something out of George Bush's playbook. We're going to call this week shock and awe because everybody hits plateaus. And once you hit these plateaus, you know what, man? It's hard to get by because you're thinking to yourself, Hey, man, I'm training hard. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm eating my food. What the hell is going on? Well, in those types of situations, first, you have to shock your system. When it comes to these types of things, when you hit plateaus, the only way to burst and get back to that growing and anabolic mode is you want to pound. You just want to get in there and do something crazy to make your body go, holy sh**, it's time to grow again. So this week... Shock and awe, each body part. Here we go. All right, we're going to start with quads. Legs. You know, man, you saw Generation Iron 3. You saw how me and Dorian were tearing up these poor physique guys. Uh, listen, I got, no, I got nothing against the physique guys. I, I, I give them credit for going out there and getting on stage and doing what they do. But, hey, man, this is a bodybuilding, and bodybuilding means legs. Okay, so quads. Shock and all for quads, there's only one thing that King Kamali knows, and that's called King of Squat. I was taught that as a teenager. I threw up many times doing this, and I guarantee you're going to throw up too. How does King of Squat work? First of all, you need, a training, you need a training partner or someone, a competitor, who's about the same strength and same insanity as you are. You want to start out under the squat rack. Start out small. 45 on each side. You rep it out. Whatever you rep, the guy who goes behind you, the guy, the next guy that goes, your partner, your competitor, has to match and do one extra rep at least. So, for example, if you're doing 15 reps with the 45s on each side, he has to do 16 or more. Then you have to raise the weight and increase the rep. So, in other words, you have to be smart. Whatever you're doing, you have, your partner has to match with an increased rep. And you do this for 45 minutes straight. I don't give a flying, you know what, how strong, how tough you are. You do this, you're going to be in the toilet praying to the porcelain gods. King of squat. Now we come to hamstrings. Superset, laying leg curls. We're talking about 100 reps. Again, you need a strong training partner who's going to look at you and who's going to scream in your face. And for me, you know, if you ever watch Lee Haney's old tapes, it's a voice. There's a certain voice that, that gets you going. I've always had training partners in my life, like, like Crazy Frank, Bolo, you know, uh, oh, Big Gabe. I mean, these guys were all characters. And when I heard that, you're a give me five more. You know, it used to piss me off. And it's a certain voice you need to hear. That's what you need. What you do, shock and off for hamstrings, leg curls, 100 reps. Whatever you're doing, let's say you start out with 100, 100 pounds, you have to get to 100 reps. You can't do no more. Your training partner drops the weight and you continue to go. If you can't, you do it on yourself. He's got to spot you. One, back on, one hand on the lower back, the other hand keeps you going from the machine. Shock and all hamstrings, super, super reps on the laying leg curl. Now we come to the calves. Torch toe presses on the leg press machine. Get on the leg press. Four to five plates on each side. Make sure that you have the safety locks in just in case you have to rack it, something goes wrong, and you start pressing. You put your feet up on the, on the, on the, uh, the stand 
and you start to go boom, 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 fast, quick reps, 100 to 150 reps. It is the most brutalizing pain you will feel. It's absolutely torturous, and that's why they call it torch toe presses because it feels like someone has a blowtorch on your calves. It is crazy. You want your calves to grow? This is the exercise to do it. Now we come to chest. Super Smith Machine presses. Okay, you've seen this before. YouTube clips of these crazy power guys doing it, these strong men, especially these guys. What you wanna do is rack up the Smith Machine with the 25s, all 25 pound plates, and one person here, one person here, one person behind you. On racket, start pressing. Come down, touch your chest back up. Again, we're talking 50, 60, 70, 80 reps. As you gotta keep moving, and every time you can't go no more, they take 25 off on each side, and you continue. You want your chest to grow, this is how you shock it. Next body part, back. Okay, I saw Dallas McGarber, may he rest in peace. He does this, I used to do this, and whoever was training him and taught him how to do this was correct. You wanna do a compound set of quarter deadlifts with barbell rows. Heavy deadlifts, 10 to 15 reps, immediately go to barbell rows. This is how you can get your back to grow. Heavy, okay, plus the shock. You cannot get, listen, there's two body parts that you cannot just train. You can get away with bullshit with shoulders and arms, no, but you can't with back and legs. You gotta train heavy. There is no other way to do it. You wanna get freaky, you gotta train heavy. You wanna do a compound set, quarter deadlifts, barbell rows, boom. Now we get to biceps, okay. One of my favorite shock, shock, shock exercises for biceps, I learned this along, I learned this in high school to be honest with you. It's called seven and sevens. This is a killer. You get an easy curl bar. When you get that easy curl bar, you gotta get a training partner to stand in front of you of equal strength and stamina. What you do is one of you gets the close grip, the other one gets the outer grip. You do one rep, pass it to him, he does one. You go all the way up to seven, and then when you hit seven, you switch grips. If you were inside, then now you're outside. The guy who was outside comes to the inside, and you come from seven back down to one. This is brutal. I'm telling you, you're gonna, everything's going to be spinning. Your heart's going to be pumping, and you're going to get blood into those arms. Biceps, seven and sevens. Okay, triceps, super dips. Get the assisted dip machine. Get someone to stand there and start dipping. All the way down, all the way up, start pounding it. When you can't go full range, half range, pound it, pound it, pound it. You can't do it anymore. Rack, he makes a little bit heavier, gives you more spot on the assist, and you keep moving. Again, we're talking about 50, 60, 70, all the way up to 100 reps. Shock. All right, and finally, we get to shoulders. What you want to do, I do this with all my clients. Not too many people can do it. You should if you can, do this exercise because it will pound and it will give you those caps that you're looking for. Side lateral drop sets, death sets I call them. What you want to do is you want to start, for me, I'll start at the 70s. 70s, 10 reps, 65, 60, 55, 50. You come all the way down until you reach the 10 pounds. 10 reps each time. Side laterals, you want to use the Versa grips if you can, if you want to keep your grip going because 99% of the time, your grip goes before your muscle goes. All the way down, non-stop. Training partner stands behind you, hands under the elbows, and keeps your ass moving. Side lateral, death drops. So that's shock and awe. I do wanna say something. Always be careful. Always think of safety first. When you're doing these crazy exercises to shock your body, you always want a good, reliable training partner, spotter to stand behind you or in front of you or whatever it is to keep your ass safe and keep you moving. Remember, this is bodybuilding, not weightlifting. So now, that's done, shock and all. Now we're gonna get into the three questions. Here we go. Question number one. This comes from Jordan Patterson. And Jordan has a really interesting question. He says, King, I know you've told some crazy stories from your IFBB days, and they're wild and awesome to hear. I personally like to hear what, were the most, what was the most successful slash fun year and the hardest, most difficult year of your pro career, and what you learned from each of those times. Okay. Uh, Jordan, I think the most successful and the most fun I had was my rookie year was 2001 and the reason for that is because 
I was in a perfect storm, meaning I was in my home environment, my restaurants, my gym, uh, everything was perfect. I was, uh, my parents 100% supported me, my friends supported me. It was just, it just, it was a tunnel vision that I had that everyone had with me and we were going straight ahead. And for me to come out and as I said before, Chad Nichols told me to wait after I got my pro card in 1999. He said, you're not ready yet, wait two years. I did exactly what he asked me to do. When I came back, um, I just wanted to get out there and show him something that no one's ever seen before from a rookie. And it was the most fun I had with all the contracts coming in and the weeder and the muscle tech and all. I mean, it was just the most amazing year of my life um, all the way to the Olympia and getting uh, top 10 and qualifying for the Olympia again, my rookie year, winning the rookie of the year honors and all that stuff. So 2001, without a question, no fun. The most difficult was 2005. And because a lot of people ask me this question all the time, they're like, King, what happened that you kept going up and down, up and down, up and down? Well, um, I gotta be honest with you guys, you know me, I always tell the truth, uh, you know, I, I got married and honestly, I have to be an honest, I married the wrong woman and there's nothing against her because she's the mother of my children, I'm not going to say anything bad and I'm going to just stop right there, but as far as bodybuilding goes, uh, it was the worst thing I could have done because she was not um, for bodybuilding, she didn't support me. And it was difficult to leave everything that I had in Virginia and come to New York and restart everything again. So 2005 was extreme, extremely difficult because I really, really battened down the hatches and went to the Ironman. And I was, I should have been third, second place. And I got fifth and I was devastated. And what happened is in the two weeks before the Ironman and the Arnold Classic, I was so possessed to go and show them what's up. And I made one critical mistake, critical mistake and I just came in flat for the Arnold Classic, and I'm, I was so ready for, for whoever was going to show up. I mean, there was my size, my conditioning, everybody. I remember Steve Blackman came into my room. Uh, it was 48 hours before the show, and he saw me, and he goes, holy sh**, everything was on point, and just that last critical mistake I made. So I think 2005, what did I learn from it? I should um, be a little bit more smart and think before I move next time. I should not make decisions without sitting down and actually thinking about it. That's what I learned from there. Question number one. Question number two comes from NZ212. NZ asks, out of all the people you have met in the sport, who's the coolest? Ooh. All right. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Who is the coolest? Um, this is a hard for me to answer because there's a, there's a couple of people on this list. And what I'll do is I'll just name... I'll give, you the, I'll give you their names and a quick reason why, because I can't pick just one. It's not possible, all right? So I'm going to start with number one, Mr. Rob Lopez. Rob Lopez, uh, I mean, he's one of my best friends, and he's the mayor of New York. And uh, listen, he's just, his middle name is fun. You know, he's cool. <laughs> he's fun. Whenever we get together, it's double trouble. It's mayhem. It's fun. It's crazy. Rob Lopez. Uh, Victor Martinez. Again, there's never a bad time with Victor Martinez. Victor is one of the coolest dudes. As a matter of fact, I remember Victor went to the Nationals, and uh, when he won the Nationals, he had his posing trunks a little bit low. And I kept saying, oh, man, wh why are his trunks low? He's got that beautiful taper. Why don't he pull it up? So I asked Victor. I said, Victor, why don't you just put it? He goes, nah, bro, it's cooler when it's down. <laughs> so I was like, this guy is the coolest motherfucker ever. And then, of course, Chris Cormier. Uh, Chris is just, I mean, there's not one person in the sport or outside the sport that doesn't love Chris Cormier. He is, you just got to love the guy. He's, he's, he's Chris. So those are the top three. Robbie, Victor, Chris. All right. Our last question comes from Ron John 111. Ron John asks, why do bodybuilders need cheat meals? All right. Good question. Because... If you eat the same things, if you eat clean all the time, this is a game of metabolism, genetics and metabolism. You have to find out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Cheat meals come into play because you need to, again, shock your system. I'm going to follow the same theme we've been following all day long, shock and awe. 
Same exact reason. You get to a point, you're dieting for a show. You don't really do have cheat meals in the off season. It's more pre-contest time. You get to a point where you're looking at yourself or you're looking at one of your clients and you see that they're lethargic. Nothing's really popping. They're not really sweating anymore. What happens? You hammer them with a cheat meal. They wake up the next morning drier, way less. Science. It's the science of bodybuilding and it works. Cheat meals. Okay, guys. Again, so much fun. We're having all the best time doing these things. Um, keep those questions coming. Keep everything, all those comments. Come up to me when you see me in the streets or the gym. Talk to me. I, I love helping you guys out. And special guests coming next week. Watch out for it. As always, peace, bitches.